Our next speaker uh, is Professor Sandri uh, Toure. Uh, her talk is Mindful Nourishment, Exploring the Diet Mental Health Connection Through Adult Hippocampal Neurogenesis. Welcome. Thank you very much and thank you Enrique for the invitation. I'm not going to talk or show data about eating disorders, but the idea I think is to bring a new idea and perspective and maybe make us think differently and collaborate. So my lab is interested in adult hippocampal neurogenesis, which is the production of new neurons in the adult hippocampus, and it's important for learning and memory and mood and emotion. And we want to understand how you modulate neurogenesis at the molecular level, but also at the environmental level in the context of health and disease, so that we can validate neurogenesis as a target for intervention, but also as a target for prevention. And we are also starting using neurogenesis as a biomarker for disease monitoring, but also uh, disease prediction. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction about what is neurogenesis in the adult hippocampus, and then I'll put that into the context into some of the projects we have in the lab. And then I'll let you think how it relates to uh, eating disorders. So the, these adult born neurons or postnatally born neurons are derived from neurostem cells that reside in the dentigerous, so you don't know if we can see here, in the dentigerous, of the hippocampus and within this granule cell layer we have the neurostem cells here in green that are going to proliferate or multiply and then they are going to migrate through this layer where they are going to become new neurons and then they are going to project uh, once mature to the internal uh, cortex so they are going to receive input from the internal cortex and project to the ca 3 and in the mouse brain or the rodent brain, it takes four to six weeks to go from a neurostem cells to a nicely mature neurons that we have labeled here through, through time. So in the human brain, neurogenesis also does exist, as shown by some nice study using carbon dating, but also more um, a modern technique such as single nuclei or RNA sequencing showing that we have neurogenesis throughout our entire life in the human hippocampus. And one of the latest work from one of my uh, colleague, colleague uh, has shown that although we have neurogenesis throughout life, it does decline steeply as, as we get older. So we can keep that in mind. So from the work from the carbon-14 dating from my colleague uh, Jonas Friesen in the Karinska Institute, he estimated that we do produce 700 newborn neurons per day in the hippocampus. So which you think it might not be a huge amount compared to the billions of neurons we have. Nevertheless, when you look at the big picture, by the time we will turn 50, we will have exchanged the entire granular cell layer. So this, this layer I showed you earlier, that the one we were born with, with one we produced during our uh, postnatal adult life. And so this adult born neuron has specific um, uh, functions. So we know that they are important for spatial memory, so finding your way around. So you use these adult born neurons. Uh, also, what we call pattern separation, so the ability of distinguishing very similar memories. So in the US, would be where you park your car every day in the same structure, arriving to work, but it's like in a different parking spot. Nevertheless, when you come back, you find your car most of the time or when you park your bike at the, at the railway station um, uh, in London or, or Oxford. So very important for that. We also know very important for adding information about time to memory, how you associate two, sm two similar, two different events in the same day or close in time. So this is uh, the job of this adult born neuron. And they are also involved in forgetting established context memory. So we don't remember much before the age of three or four, because at this time we have this burst of neurogenesis. So we have a constant birth of new neurons and it disturbs all these circuits, all this established memory. So you don't want too much neurogenesis either as you get older. So it's all about, about the balance. So they are also important and related to mood and depression. So in animal model of depression, where we chronically stress the mice, we are going to induce a decreased neurogenesis. And we also decrease neurogenesis in a patient, in postmortem tissue of patients suffering from a major depressive in, uh, disorder. And then finally, many treatment, many antidepressants for depression actually work via neurogenesis. So you need a functional neurogenesis for some antidepressant to be uh, to be uh, to be working. So the good thing about neurogenesis is that actually you can modulate it in everyday life. 
Uh, so, for example, uh, on the plus side, so we will have social enrichment, social interaction uh, will increase neurogenesis. This is what we are doing today. This is what you guys are going to do over lunch later. This is going to be good for our neurogenesis. Learning itself is going to be uh, increasing neurogenesis. Sexual uh, intercourse is good for neurogenesis for both sex, male and female. So here, gender equality. So on. <laughs> The left side, unfortunately, social isolation, which we have seen during COVID uh, in, in our model as well, we see in a mouse model of social isolation, we see a decrease in neurogenesis. Chronic stress will decrease neurogenesis. Chronic sleep deprivation will decrease neurogenesis. And as I mentioned, as we get older, we have this natural drop in neurogenesis. So the talk is about uh, diet and, and nourishment, and indeed diet can modulate neurogenesis quite easily. So I put a few uh, representation here on the slide. So on, we'll start with the bad thing. So anything that's related uh, actually to uh, a deficiency, a deficiency uh, in a vitamin is going to decrease neurogenesis. And we have shown in our uh, own study, malnutrition itself will decrease neurogenesis. Uh, alcohol consumption will uh, decrease neurogenesis. Uh, caffeine consumption will decrease neurogenesis, whereas coffee actually is good for neurogenesis. So I'll let you figure out what type of coffee you want to order <laughs> later for lunch. Uh, so the good thing is that you can reverse that uh, by eating maybe uh, omega-3 fatty acids, which is, you know, uh, for example, in, uh, in fatty fish or in certain algae or flavonoids that are present in, in blueberry and curcumins. So you can modulate neurogenesis quite easily. And this is what we think. It might be a good target indeed if you want to prevent cognitive decline with aging or if you want to prevent onset of depression with with chronic stress. So this is why in the lab we are trying to understand how you modulate neurogenesis at the environmental level and molecular level in health and disease. And in health we are looking at uh, healthy um, uh, cognitive aging in the context of intervention with diet and exercise and how you move from a healthy cognitive aging to uh, neurological uh, disorders such as uh, Alzheimer's disease, cognitive impairment and mood and depression. So in the lab, we are using animal model, as I mentioned, we are using cells from patients, but we are using also uh, human hippocampal stem cells as a, as a model in a dish and even as a stress model in a dish. So what this figure shows is that you have usually your healthy cells and we add the stress hormone, human stress hormone cortisol, you decrease the level of neurogenesis, but then you can rescue with adding uh, antidepressants, so here, sertraline. And we have used this model already in the past to identify the mode of action of antidepressant, but also to identify drug for repositioning, or also identify nutrient-derived uh, uh, bioactive that prevents the stress-induced decrease uh, of neurogenesis. And of course, when you work in vitro, you have to make sure that what you find in a dish is relevant to the general population. And we have shown indeed that what we have seen in our little dish, yes, we see some of our findings that are reflecting in epidemiological data or even in uh, some genetic data in relevance to, for example, the volume of the hippocampus. So, and when we think about using neurogenesis or the process of neurogenesis as a biomarker, what we have done recently is using the serum from participants or serum from patients, adding to our cell line. And then we measure a different readout, including neurogenesis. And what we have seen is that, for example, we can use this test to predict using the serum of participants that come in the clinic with mild cognitive impairment if they are going to progress to Alzheimer's disease or not, with a nice 95% accuracy up to three years before they convert to Alzheimer's disease. So when we want to think back about lifestyle, exercise and diet, then we have to step back and look at bigger cohort. And this is what I've done in this European <laughs> consortium where we looked at a cohort where we had some nice dietary data, metabolite and lipidomics data 12 years before these people started to uh, decline or stay stable. And we could see that indeed, we could measure with the serum and the metabolome that we're acting together with dietary intake and exercise and neurogenesis to predict then the onset of, of cognitive decline. And we have seen that as well in the context of depression. Of course, it was not the same actually dietary requirement and exercise in that context was, was not involved. So just to finish, I mentioned that you know, this is what we are doing. We are looking at neurogenesis as a target for you know, improving cognition and mood and thinking about 
the comorbidity of eating disorders, maybe I want to make you reflect, um, could we use neurogenesis as a potential target either for a biomarker to monitor recovery? Because we see that this is a phenomenon that you can rescue quite easily. Uh, when we think about indeed the comorbidity or, around cognition, around mood, but also around the structural changes uh, of the hippocampus. So with that thought, um, and then we, we want to try to, to, to tackle that with some of the people in the crew uh, team here. We have already had, had discussions, so I hope it, it is going to happen. Uh, um, so I would like to thank my lab and our funding body and, and the audience. Thank you very much. Um, I'm aware that there's some evidence to suggest that certain dietary behaviours such as um, reducing calorie intake or yep. intermittent fasting can increase neurogenesis in the hippocampus. Yes. I was wondering if you could provide some explanation as to why these behaviours, which are seemingly negative, would lead to an increase in uh, mm -hmm. neurogenesis. So, yeah, that's a very good question. So we, uh, we have looked at this data indeed. We have looked at the molecular pathway. And what we can see in mouse model is that when you decrease, when the calorie intake actually decrease the calorie intake is not as efficient as the intermittent fasting. So you can do intermittent fasting in mice without decreasing the calorie intake. And we can see that some of the molecular pathways are related to the clotho protein, which is the longevity protein. So this is a protein that is going to increase lifespan. And this has been shown in many, many species. And we think that maybe it's related to some of evolution aspect, meaning that you don't have food there, so maybe you need to increase the type of neuron that is going to, you know, make you find this food. So this is where we think that, you know, there is this aspect. But in the context of eating disorders, you know, maybe this is something we need to, to look out and watch out. I, I wouldn't say exactly this is why it was not especially on my slide because I don't think this is appropriate in that context. I think it's better to focus on the nutrients that actually have the similar effect that, you know, rather than the calorie restriction or the intermittent fasting such as the omega-3 fatty acid are, has massive effect. But it's a really good question, but yeah, looking into, into that mo most likely evolutionary perspective, like you have less food, you need to generate more neuron, uh, and there are data in, in lots of species and studies that squirrel, for example, that have different way of hiding food. So we think that the spatial memory as well is needed to find the food in an evolutionary perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, well. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, Sandrine. In your cohort of aging, what measures do you have? So we have a lot of, we don't have, so we don't have eating habit. We have, we, we have journals. So we have dietary journals, but we also have metabolomics, uh, lipidomics, and we have cognition, depression. So we have, I mean, a big, big list. But you it. don't have brain. No, we don't. They are still alive. So, so good for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we have some imaging. There is some imaging. Body? No, not body. Uh, brain imaging. Okay. Yeah. Um, be, because your thought made me think mm -hmm. this is reversible nutrition, yes. etc. We work mm -hmm. on DNA methylation. Yeah. So maybe you can have a link DNA methylation. We have identified DNA methylation either within Imagine or, or the Enigma consortium mm -hmm. in relation to brain. We can look at the hippocampus and great. we can do the opposite also. Yeah, if, we you have serum, things, yeah. if you have serum from some of your participants. We great. do have serum, but we don't, well, well, we did that from mm -hmm. blood, so. Cool. Yes. Great. Yes. Super. Yeah. Very good. Very nice. Yeah. Let's um, uh, give another round of applause to Sandra. <laughs>